Hello and welcome to Talking Live. I'm Dr. Robbie Ludwig right here in Starshot Studio in Times Square. And we are interviewing today the founder of Untuck It, Chris Rico Bono. Did I say that right? Rico, yes. Bono, Rico Bono. Right. Is the founder, the creator. We're going to find out his secret to success. I'm sure you've seen the commercial. It gets played all the time. Are you now a celebrity in many ways? Yeah, a lot of people call me the Untuck It Man. Do you like that? Do you to... like that nickname? No, it's great. Yeah, it's, uh, it's nice. We run the, the, the Walking in Soho commercial. Now we have uh -huh. a new one. I don't know if you've seen it. Oh, you haven't? No, no. I feel like I'm missing out. Yeah, it's, it's called All Shapes and Sizes to show that we fit all different size men, uh -huh. different ages. And we're running that nationally right now. Now, you really were not in fashion. When you came up with the idea for Untuck It, you were working in a very different field. Yeah, I was working in healthcare. I had no uh -huh. experience at all. Always wanted to get out of corporate America, uh -huh. um, but I wasn't sure how I was going to do it. And it's intimidating to start to actually take that leap. I mean, a lot of people have ideas, but to take the leap is what kind of differentiates it. Yeah, the yeah. Because a lot of leaps don't work, a and lot a of lot of startup companies are not successful. No, it's, it's very few make it. Um, yeah. And especially when your your idea is a shorter shirt, you know, uh -huh. it's, uh, you tell people that idea and most they laugh at you. And I, I used to come up with idea after idea. And this one, I think people, even my family, even my parents said, I, I just don't get it. You know, oh, really? Work? They didn't get it. You tell a funny story about being on vacation and wearing the same shirt every day. Yeah, tell our audience about that. You know, for, me, for me, it was really just a problem that I needed to solve, which mm -hmm. they say are the best, the best companies to start. I had one, I had three shirts, went to Las Vegas, I was a young guy, and um, I put on the, the one that fit the best the first night that wasn't too long, mm -hmm. and it was an out of spec shirt, it was like a size small, which I'm not a size small, uh -huh. and I went to put on the other one the next night, and it just felt too long, so I wore the same shirt three nights in a row. And I, <laughs> Did your friends call you out on it? Yeah, but they knew I was so into this, getting a shirt at the right length, and they, yeah. they felt the same way. I mean, this is something that people laugh at who don't know it, but those who know it, there's a lot of guys including my partner. I remember calling my partner and telling him the idea and he cut me off. He said, I'm in. I, I know exactly what you're talking about. Did so, you know that you were onto something special when you called your partner and he said, I'm in? Because it sounds like you had pitched yeah, him other ideas that didn't go oh, so well. I pitched him hundreds of ideas. Uh -huh. And this one, he just cut me right off. And then um, we did a survey. 95% of the people had the exact same problem. So I went into, uh, I went down to Soho and went into every department store, Bloomingdale's, took 20 shirts in, brought a measuring tape. I would put them on, measure them all, see you know what the lengths were, and I realized it really didn't exist. Uh -huh. um, the shirt perfectly designed to be worn untucked. And then we started marketing, and the response. I mean, we would get e paragraph emails thanking us for uh -huh. coming up with the idea. So there was like there was an excitement out there. It wasn't just like another clothing. I line. mean, Marvin, who is um, who helps <laughs> us out at Star Shop, he is like your number one fan <laughs> because he wears your shirts all the time, and it looks great on him. And they're quality they shirts. Look great. Thank you. You know, we were touching him. He's like, "Don't touch me." But his shirt was so great, we had to. We had to. So I think people who really are your fan base really are committed to wearing your shirts. And you will like this story. This is an honest to God story. So on Monday, when we regularly tape, we had um, Jay Sean on, who is a international musician and rock star. And his mother-in-law bought a shirt for her husband that she had a return and she was raving about the customer service. Oh, that's she said, your customer service is beyond and amazing. Do you do special training with yeah, that's, customer I mean, service? In the new world of e-commerce, if your customer service isn't tremendous, you're just, you're not going to make it. It's probably other than quality of product. It's probably our second most focused on area. Um, people want the process to be very easy. They want to okay. order it, get it the next, now they want to get it the next day because Amazon kind of set that standard ah. and they want to, um, they want it to be easy because it can't, because it can get complex on the internet and, and our demographic, what people don't know about us is our demographic is evenly distributed between 25 and 70 years old. So it's uh -huh. a massive market. And obviously the older you are, like my daddy, then they don't, you know, you didn't grow up on the computer. So you have right. to, you have to help the customer out and um, we spend a lot of time. We don't treat our customer service as like a separate part of the company, mm -hmm. which a lot of companies do. They kind of they'll bring it overseas or we they're right in our office. They're trained with us. Um, they learn everything about the product. They're they're there when we make the product so they can really live and breathe it. I know you went to an Ivy League 
school for your master's. You went to Columbia Business School. Uh, I was talking to my son earlier about you because he's interested in business. Do you think there's something about going to an Ivy League business school for your master's that helped you come up with this idea or shape the way you think to have a successful company? Yeah, I think a few things. One is net, they always say one of the reasons to get your MBA is networking, and it's really true. I mean, the oh, people God. I've met there, the, the uh, my partner came from there. It's, it, mm. Who knows if I would have pursued this um, if I didn't kind of have that conversation with him. You meet just some of the smartest guys out there. And also, yeah, I mean, there's the thing about being an entrepreneur is you need to know a little about everything. I mean, you need to know about marketing. You need to know about supply chain. You need to know operations. And that's what's great about about business school is you literally can take all these special courses where you know mm -hmm. accounting. Because in the beginning, for the first four years, it was just me and my partner. That was it. So we were I was doing everything. You know, I was at night. I was the customer I, service I guy. I was that. the shipper. I was the um, marketing person. I was the accounting person. I was the finance person. So that's where business school, I think, really helps you kind of learn a little bit about. You can take courses in all different areas. And it sounded like your family and friends were very supportive. That's where you first went to get your money to invest. Yeah, well, friends and family, although it was not easy. Like I said, you go to a lot of these guys and say, most of them are used to getting tech pitches. Or, right. You know, I'm starting Google or, and I'm saying I'm making a shorter shirt. So it was, <laughs> it was, it was a lot of laughing, you know, yeah. um, but. It's, uh, we ended up raising $150,000. We did things much differently. We didn't raise money. Most fashion companies start with about a million dollars. Yeah. We, and most fashion companies do not work. Well, most, or yeah. Do I think not it's like one money. out of three billion make it. It's a very tough yeah. business. But we, um, we didn't raise money because we couldn't. And we then didn't raise for six years. And we were profitable from day one, which is very rare. Wow. But we had to be. We had no, if we were not profitable, we would have been out of money. So. So what do you think um, contributed to the success of your company in terms of actually making money right away? Because it's like you and you know, Tory Burch are the two people that come to mind yeah. and made money really right away. Yeah, it's just that we were really smart and we with our marketing. I don't want to say really smart. Some of it was luck. But we were very cautious. Anytime we would spend money, we would talk about it for a full day. And, uh -huh. and then we, and, and we got lucky. We had a great product and a great differentiators so people reacted our marketing I guess that when I think about it most people who have a new company they market it takes a few months mm -hmm. to return with us when people were we were marketing on radio no fashion companies market on radio because you can't see the product right but with us it was shirts designed to be worn untucked that's all we would say and people would rush to the site so we were having immediate return on investment we would we would run an ad in the morning and you know, by midday, we'd make our money back on that. And actually, a lot of people are listening to that sports radio. Because I, I remember I did an interview on sports radio. I know nothing about sports. And I can't tell you how many people were like, I heard you. Yeah, so a lot huge. of people are listening. But you also did advertising in airline magazines. Yeah, it was all we could afford at the time. Because uh -huh. an airline magazine compared to like a GQ magazine is much less expensive. When we were doing it, no one was doing it. You know, fashion mat now... Everyone has, I think, seen our success. They're so probably following now, now in a lot your of, footsteps. Yeah, a lot of fashion brands are in there. But we were thinking it's a really captive audience. You're sitting there. Everyone, right. we've all been on planes. When you're, If you're on the runway too long or yeah. you just grab oh, totally. it and flip through it. Yeah. We've been in every single airline magazine every single month for about five years now. And it's most people see us there. Like That's when they that's when I say, they say untuck it. So that's a little secret that even when entrepreneurs call me to start businesses, I say, go there because you can afford it and the returns are great. So. Your, your instincts though are, are very on point because when you were first starting the company, people wanted you to use your name because you have a very kind of Italian exotic name that sounds very fancy yeah. and you said no. Yeah, I mean, if you look around, you think about John Barbados, um, yeah. Michael Coors, there, there were, most of them are designer names yeah. or they're sophisticated names. Mm -hmm. Brooks Brothers, but you'll see them in script and cursive and real high end. And when I, you know, it's funny, what made me launch the brand was when I came up with the name Untuck It. That's when mm -hmm. I said, I'm doing this. It's, I called a PR friend of mine and that one person happened to love it. Uh -huh. And then Untuck It shirts designed to be one Untucked. It sounds very simple, but that must have taken six months to kind of get it perfect the way we wanted it to be read. And it's no question, I think, the reason we're successful, or one of the main reasons we're successful is our name. It's become, 
when you hear it, you know, now people walk down the street and they'll say he's wearing an untucket. He's not even wearing an untucket. Oh, right? wow. But it's kind of like the Kleenex tissue thing. Yes. So it's such a recognizable name. And I, I've been sitting places and I'll just hear people talking about Untuck It. How does that feel when you hear that? That's great. It's very exciting, obviously. Does it um, feel like your baby? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, still, I bet. We have 300 people, I think, working for us now, which has been in the last year. Like, that's been the growth. Um, and it's still strange, you know, because I still think about a year and a half ago, it was just... Four of us. I just want to ask you about the first commercial because that's what I saw all the time. And I I was riveted by the first commercial. And I'm I'm in the media, so I, I look at but it was like very compelling in its simplicity. You were in the commercial. Yep. Those are expensive to make. Was that when you had a venture capitalist come in and say we want to invest in you? No, that was way before we, we actually developed the commercial on our own. You did? Yeah. So we were um we were able to save a lot of money that way. You know, it was, it was a, we were trying to connect with entrepreneurs and we were also trying to put something up there that was going to kind of stop people. It's funny because we, you know, a lot of people make fun of the commercial and they say, this guy's crazy. He thinks, does he think he solved cancer? Cause I'm serious. <laughs> I'm walking down the street. It was supposed to be kind of the way I walk to work when I'm walking my head's down, I'm thinking all uh -huh. the time, but the re it became, I mean, we would run it on on a NFL game and within two minutes, 16,000 people would be to the site. Wow. And it, my theory is because it is a little bit strange. I'm walking down talking about shirts like I saved the world, <laughs> but it was the kind of thing that would stop people and say, what is this guy doing? What I is he talking about? I and, didn't feel, I didn't yeah. get that sense. I just thought it conveyed like masculine cool. Yeah, well, you know? I think certain people also felt that. But maybe because I'm a woman, but, you know, I was like, that's like masculine, yeah. cool, and what a great concept. But I think a lot, a lot of guys don't think about fashion um, the way I do, but, they, but I think subconsciously they do, meaning they'll say, I'm not into fashion, but they don't want to overthink it. But when they, right. our shirt is so simple. It's just, it's a nice shirt that fits great and is the right length. So mm -hmm. I think guys would see the commercial and they'd say, this is strange. I never thought of it. I don't have this problem. And then they'd go right to the site and then they'd start researching it and then they would see the before and after photos. So it was, it was, ended up being a great commercial. You decided at one point to go from online, which was very successful for you, to actually have these stores. In, in New York, I think we have a picture of your Soho shop. You're, you have a flagship store in Fifth Avenue. You're now national you're about to be international i'll let you tell that story were you concerned at all because that seems to raise the expense yeah in 2015 business. we decided we we're just going to do a quick pop-up in soho thinking uh -huh. we can get some extra revenue at the end of the year and the response was just incredible because what was happening was we were marketing so much but it's it's tough to get people to pull the trigger right they hear it they like it now you yeah. got to go on the internet you got to order what was happening is people were coming in and saying, oh my God, I've, I just walked by here. I've heard you, I've read it, I've wanted to buy. And then they would see the product and they would buy. So it was kind of like that last way to get people over, over the top. The bigger thing is, like I said, our demographic's older and older people tend to still want to do the routine they've always done, which is brick and mortar. Interesting. And there were a lot of guys who came in and said, I just don't buy shirts unless I can, I don't buy anything unless I can touch and feel it. And it's about seven, I think I, there's a stat out there, it's like 70% of men will not buy online unless they see and touch the product. It's easy to return stuff now, but it's still not that easy. You have to get a right. label, put it on, drop yeah. it off. So we opened that store, did amazing. We opened five the next year, and then we opened 20 last year, and we'll open 30 this year. So it's pretty much the fastest you know, store openings, I think, ever. Um, and somehow we're doing it with a small team. So we'll have 54 this year. We'll have 100 by the end of next year. And we're opening in Toronto. It's our first international store. Oh, congratulations. Thank you. In September, um, which is very exciting. And then we're going to go into England probably mid next year. Fantastic. So it's uh, very exciting. I'm sure it's going to be very, very successful in both those places. Now, one thing I did not realize when I was first doing research for our interview is that you also have women's clothing not just shirts and also children's clothing. I have a little, this is from your website, but you have dresses and you, so you expanded beyond the original yeah, idea. Yeah, I mean, originally it was shirts and then we started getting people emailing us saying they need golf shirts, polo shirts, because they're the same problem, they're too long, then they need t-shirts. So we were listening to our customer 
Um, then we launched shorts one day and they sold out and obviously shorts are n have nothing to do with theme design. <laughs> we want our touch, but people really liked the brand. They, they wanted to buy. It was easy. They, they love the customer you. service. Yeah. They trust you. People like to find men like to find one place they can shop for everything. Mm -hmm. The that's, women's, that's very true. Yeah. It makes it very easy for true. them. The Men women's like one store. Yeah. And the women's was once we opened the stores, women would be in there all the time, whether they were buying for their husbands or right. boyfriends, or they were just waiting for them to try on. And every woman was saying, I wish you had something for me to look at. So mm -hmm. that's how that started. Um, and it'll never be a major part of our business, but it's a nice, it's nice for the brand kids. Same thing. We love the idea of all kids wear their shirts untucked. Yeah. You know, it's an obvious one. And, matching your dad and wearing it in the try they love the triangle and so it's been it's been very good very successful how has your role changed over the years with untuck it you know people always say now that you know you have 100 or 50 stores and you must be working around the clock and the funny thing is i'm working less than i ever worked i'm working a lot but <laughs> for six years i mean i was literally working 20 hours a day i, mean, I remember on christmas i had my computer on uh, next to me because I was doing literally everything, like everything. It was, it was almost, it was overwhelming. You know, it's called we were, a one man we, ban in yeah, my business. Exactly, yeah, yeah. And I hear you. So it was crazy. And then finally, but every successful entrepreneur that I have spoken to, like it cosmetics, same thing. They put money into the business. They did everything themselves or they would hire an inexpensive intern to do something for them. I, I guess that's the way you have to think. Yeah, well, there's, there's two things. One is you don't have the money to, right. to hire. And two is you become very possessive of this thing. Yeah. Every area that I had to give up, I had a tough time. Yeah. Uh, even to today, even today, I mean, for, for having a, you know, 300 people, I'm pretty much in tune with every decision mm -hmm. just because you want it. I mean, you have to let go. It's, it's good for the business and right. for it to really scale that big. Um, but it, it's hard to do because, you know, it's at times you, you think there's stores operating out there where I haven't even met the people yeah. and you're hoping that they're doing the right thing and, right. and speaking the right, right way about the brand. So, but it's, it's been a fun, very fun ride. Now, this is not your only passion. Um, you talk about your dad, who's a physician, getting you exposed to wine, which is a real passion of yours. In fact, you had a wine blog, which is temporarily retired. Yes. But I have a feeling it's going to come back in some way, shape, One or day. form. Yeah. So actually, I credit part in that vine, which was this this wine blog that very few people watched. But it was very fun because I was traveling around the world interviewing winemakers. Uh -huh. um, and people were sending wine. I would, I would taste on camera and teach people. But um, it got me, like I said, about entrepreneurs, everyone we've all met has an idea and says, oh, I have this great idea, but very few people take the risk. Right. And part of that vinyl why do you think that is? Because it's scary. I mean, it's scary. First of all, <laughs> it's money. You have to, you right. know, even pardon that vine, I think, I mean, I, I don't know the exact amount of money, but I had to invest money into that. Mm -hmm. um, so it's scary. And um, you have to a lot of times leave your job, uh, which is a lot of risk. So. Right. I just don't think people want to take the risk. Um, but anyway, Pardon That Vine got me to take that risk, to put uh -huh. money in, to launch a website, to learn about social media. Then I parlayed that into, okay, I can do Untuck It. We named all the shirts after wine. Um, and then our stores have some wine decor. And it's been great because there is some parallel there, guys who want to look nice, wear a dress shirt. Everyone's drinking wine these days. Yeah. It's every demographic, you know. It's just, um, so it's... Yeah, that's definitely a passion, collecting wine. Yeah, yeah. It's a dangerous hobby, though. So your dad must be so proud of you. Yeah, no, he is. He goes to every, up to every guy in a restaurant and uh -huh. lets him know that, you know. Oh, that's so nice. He sees the triangle. He always wears the shirts. That's a sign of success, yeah. right? When your parents brag about <laughs> you. Well, we do something called the quick five. I tell people it's because I'm nosy and a therapist. So will you <laughs> bear with me and answer five quick questions that yes. we have? Okay. If you could know the absolute truth to one question, what question would you ask? Oh gosh. Anything? Anything. The truth about anything. Mm, I guess the obvious, what, where do you go when you die, really? What's oh, the... that's a good question. <laughs> yeah, that's something nobody really It'd be knows. be great to really know. Yeah, that. wouldn't that be nice? It'd be so comforting. Yeah. Right? Hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully it would be covered. Right. Right. It might be depressing. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's true too. Maybe it's best we don't know. Yeah. <laughs> that's Marvin, our COO of Starshop. Um, positive thinking always. 
<laughs> What's the best piece of advice you've ever received? Best piece of advice. Um, oh God, there's so, so much, so many great, you know, my dad's taught me so much, but just from an entrepreneurial perspective, mm -hmm. what was it actually an article I read about Steve Jobs, who's probably the world's greatest entrepreneur, mm. just kind of explaining it, going back to the risk that yeah. he kind of, he kind of said it, that we're all, everyone's going to die at the end. We're right. all the same. There's no, there's no such thing as risk was his point. Like you only have this very finite time to do things. So what's the worst that's going to happen? You're going to not do well. And then you're going to, he did this whole thing about you're going to die. He ended up dying young, which is yeah. interesting, but it's basically the point was you got to take chances. There's nothing. We're not, if you're here forever, it's different, but you're not. So, so that resonated with me about taking risk. And, and the worst that's going to happen is I'm going to fail and not be successful, but I'm not here that long anyway. So, the, you know, so. right. It's worth a shot. Um, when he has I, a lot of great quotes. when I was, um, well, as a therapist and when I was writing my latest book, we found that the research showed that people did not regret what they tried and failed. They regretted what they didn't try. Yep. And that's what gnawed at them. So that's Well, failing keeping... is some of the best times when you look back. The yeah. problem is you don't enjoy it while it's happening. And it right. definitely makes the triumphant side yes. of things much, much better. It's really part of the process yeah. if, if you have the right perspective. As a child, what did you want to be when you grew up? I guess like most kids, an athlete. I thought, I, you know, uh -huh. I was, I played tennis through college. I lived and breathed sports. Uh -huh. um, my dad was a doctor. What I, kind of doctor? A gastroenterologist. Okay. But I knew I didn't want to be that just from, from watching him. I, I feel like that's my son. He, because my husband's a doctor. So uh, okay. he's like, oh, too much work. Yeah. <laughs> I just want to exactly. make money. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I was really into sports. Um, so I guess I dreamed that. And then, then I wanted player. to go into well, finance. Well, you had the look yeah. of a famous tennis player, so. <laughs> then I wanted to go into finance like everyone else in this, who grows up, you know, in this tri-state area. So true. Um, yeah. And if then, you grow up in L.A., you want to be an actor. Exactly. If you grow up on the East Coast, you want to be in, in a hedge fund. Exactly. Yeah. 100%. <laughs> yeah. yeah. If your life was a movie, which could happen, Chris. Maybe. You know, that's next. <laughs> what songs would you want to be on the soundtrack? I'm a big country music really fan, a lot of people around well these days it's become popular uh-huh yeah but um yeah i'm a huge eric church fan so okay a lot of and, and country to me tells the story mm -hmm. of life really well yeah it's kind of um talks about the journey and the ups and downs yes so I, would, I would say some one of an eric church song okay so hopefully somebody's listening out there because <laughs> i totally see you being a movie yeah yeah hopefully so who would play you mm. in real life? Yeah. I mean, who would play, yes. Who would play you in a movie in real life? Oh boy. What actor? Hmm. Like I could see a Tom Cruise type, but he's too old. Yeah. Um, and of course it's not my movie, so it's not for me to choose. I don't know. These days I watch more TV, you know, these great TV shows. Yeah, okay. Um, that's a tough one. Who? Oh, that Bradley could be Cooper. It. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, thank you, Maureen. That was from it. our makeup artist, <laughs> and she's weighing in. So it's a whole family affair here. Well, thank you, Chris, for thank coming. You very much. I know you're I really, really, really busy, and just we're thrilled to meet you. And congratulations on your success and future success. And I know that there's more to come. And thank you for joining us. Weigh in with any questions you have, and we'll see you next week on Talking Live.